I've got eyes on the wreckage. There's the crash site. All the metal is very sharp here. We found the wreckage of the C-54 headed to Area 51. What's going on everybody? I'm Mark Vins, and this is about to be our most ambitious adventures with me yet. Tomorrow, we're gonna hike to the peak of that mountain behind us to find what's left of this aircraft. And get this, that airplane, it was headed to Area 51. All right, here we go. Mount Charleston Peak. 8.3 miles ahead of us. This is going to be one of the most extreme adventures we've ever done on Brave Wilderness. This crash site is just 50 feet from the summit. I hopefully find the remains of the flight that faithfully crashed that November day back in 1955. While the journey ahead would be an extreme feat of endurance, my mind was fixated on what we might find at the crash site, or if we would even find the wreckage at all. To get back down before dark, we wouldn't have much time at the summit, nor did we bring the gear required for an overnight expedition. Our awareness of this time crunch was great fuel to continue the march toward the top. However, what would we find when we got there? This was a plane headed to Area 51 after all. Were there secret documents left behind? Spy plane devices? Parts from an alien spacecraft? Literally anything was possible. But first, we had to get there. Look at that right there. That is snowpack left from the winter season. That's how high in elevation we're headed today. This altitude has snow almost half of the year. And as this is melting away, we're seeing the last bits of what's left. A little bit of a false summit here. Looks like we've reached the top of the first leg. Now we've got to cover some real distance in miles. Here's a sign. Let's see what it says. Griffith Peak Trail. It takes you to the top right there. You can see the summit. But we're headed to Charleston Peak, which is that way. Still a long way to go for us. It's not even a halfway point. Okay, we made it to checkpoint number three. Up the switchbacks, over the saddle. Now this is the grassy knoll and we're about to enter the burnt forest. And once we hit this tree line, I'll tell you why it got that name. Oh yeah, look at that. Definitely see the burnt forest embodied by this tree. It's absolutely charred on the inside. And in 2013, this entire mountainside was leveled by a 28,000 acre wildfire. And this is the last checkpoint on our map before we make our way to the summit at Mount Charleston, the burnt forest. And it's a very ominous checkpoint, if I don't mind saying so. I mean, we're looking for a plane crash that was actually coming in. If you just put your camera over there, that's the valley and beyond that's California. The flight was leaving from Burbank, California on its way to Area 51, got stuck in some bad weather. And because of the secrecy of this mission, the plane was actually flying underneath the radar and unfortunately missed clearing the peak of Mount Charleston by 50 feet. The velocity that it impacted with scattered the aircraft all over the mountainside. So with any luck today, we will find the remnants of that infamous plane crash. Oh, there it is, the summit, the summit of Mount Charleston. I can actually see in the distance, there's a flag marking the top and there's a trail. Hang on a second. I see something up there. Where I'm gonna get out my binoculars. Oh yeah, 100% the crash site. I've got eyes on the wreckage. We did it. We found the wreckage of the C-54 headed to Area 51. I'd say we're probably half mile or less away. Let's go get it. Whoa, you got your on? First piece of aircraft, yes. That is 100% a piece of an aircraft. I'm just shocked. I did not expect to see 
a piece of this plane that far away from the crash site that we saw from our binoculars. You can see that this is some kind of mechanical piece. There's a pipe. Uh, I don't know what part this is, but you can see that there's a serial number there. There used to be some kind of part number, but that's worn away. I mean, it is 65 years old, so you'd expect it to road quite a bit. About a half a mile away from the crash site. It must have hit full speed. All right, let's keep moving. There it is. There's the crash site. Let's go. Okay, I got my energy back. We found the plane. That's the main wreckage site. Oh man, there it is. This must be part of the comms. The communication system would have wires like this. You can see them all. Almost looks like a spool of yarn. Okay, hopefully this will get us out of the wind. This altitude is making it really hard. It's cold. It's windy, and we're exhausted. A little less windy. Oh wow, that's a piece of an engine. That's a piece of an engine for sure. We found the main piece of wreckage, but I can tell you, just at a quick glance, there's debris scattered all over this mountain. You can see more of the fuel silage down there. We might carefully try to go down there in a minute but first let's inspect what's right before us and honestly folks i'm looking for anything recognizable like i can tell that a piece like this is from the fuel silage it looks like the exterior of the plane yeah there's some more axle looking i mean that that to me looks like a landing gear let's go inspect that be careful this stuff is really sharp and really trip hazardous yeah so you can see the hydraulics here and you can see this had a manual release. This is a lever. I'm not an expert. If there's any aeronautical experts watching this, tell us what this is. I believe this is a piece of the landing gear. Let's uh, move down here. There's a huge piece of the fuel slodge. All right, this is kind of a little bit dangerous. This mountainside is very crumbly and uh, all the metal is very sharp here. So I don't want to grab onto the wrong piece. I go home with a nasty cut. I definitely don't recommend anybody go off trail, but I'm experienced in hiking and taking the precautions necessary to do this. This is the biggest piece of the plane that's out here right now. At least the biggest piece that we found. I'm sure there are other pieces spread throughout this entire range, but any further down the hill, it gets super unsafe. In fact, I highly recommend if you ever come to the site, you don't come down this far, you stay on the trail. Let's tuck in right here so we can get out of the wind. I'll talk to you for a second, to tell you a little bit more about what you're seeing. There's a few reasons why this aircraft is in the condition that it is. One is obvious, there was a crash. The second reason is about a year after the crash, the Air Force came up here and detonated this plane with dynamite, blew it up to smithereens. And that's because of the secret nature of the mission, they were headed to Area 51 to work on the project, none other than the U-2 spy plane used in the Cold War. Very, very famous aircraft, very critical for US intelligence in the Cold War. And they couldn't risk any of those parts being confiscated or getting into enemy hands. So they came up here and detonated what was left. And that's the real reason why you see so much of the rubble around us right now. Uh, back in 1955, right after the crash, the fuel silage, the rear of the plane, we'll show you a picture, was largely intact. Coming from Burbank, the airplane, as you can see, we're almost to the summit. The summit's right there. It almost made it. We're talking 50, at most 100 feet to clear the ridge. And it's very unfortunate because this is the tallest point in the whole area. So they nearly made it. And Area 51 at Groom Lake is just about uh, an hour and a half north of here, drive-wise. So they were very close by plane. Uh, I'm overwhelmed right now with a lot of emotions. 14 lives were lost in this crash. And because of the secrecy of the mission, their families weren't even notified for four decades later. I can only imagine what they went through, not only losing their loved ones, but not knowing how and not knowing why. Definitely a lot of admiration for the work that they were doing, protecting the freedoms of the United States, keeping us safe, a very unfortunate 
circumstance that took place here back in 1955. And very interesting piece of history, an absolutely amazing adventure. I do ask if you ever come up here to see this wreckage that you leave it be, leave it intact. This is a historical site uh, out of respect for those who were affected by the crash. That was awesome. But now it's gravity's turn to control the next adventure. So what is Zorbing, you might ask? Well, it appears pretty simple. Essentially, they stuff us into one of these inflatable balls and then they roll us down a mountainside. What could go wrong? I will not be Zorbing because I get a little motion sick and I don't want to add any liquids to the water that's already in there. Good luck, dude. Let's do it. See ya. First things first. We gotta get to the top of the hill. Let's go. I'm gonna be walking up this hill three times today because there are three courses. There's the fast track, which just goes straight down the hill. There's the zigzag, which as you can tell by the name, zigs and zags. And then the last course, course number three, is called the drop. Now I haven't seen this course, but I can kind of tell by the name. It includes some kind of free fall. And I figured that sounds like it's worth saving for last. So anyway, I'm at the top. I see the, uh, the Zorbs are about ready. And I'm about to get in and try my hand at one of New Zealand's favorite activities, Zorbing. All right, I figured I'd do a little bit of uh, some play-by-play -play action. We got Mark up there. He's not in the ball yet. We've been waiting patiently. I'm anxious. I'm a bit nervous. I hope he accomplishes his dream. I'm just talking to the camera. Really? Just talking to myself as usual. All right, this might be the moment. We've been here for over an hour. He's not in the ball yet. I think he's getting cold feet. I believe in you, Mark. You can do it. Get in that ball, bro. Get in that ball and roll down. All right, how's it going? I'm Mark. I'm Esther, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So you're gonna be the one controlling the ride today. I'm gonna be the one kicking you down the hill, yep. Do you, do you literally just I stomp just, me down? Sometimes I do that, okay. but um, I might have to push you because you're a little bit heavier. I'm a little bit heavier. Well, I did have a big breakfast this morning. I hope that's <laughs> what you mean. But why don't we go through the protocol here? Like explain to us what is Zorbing and what's the goal of the experience? So if you ever wonder what it's like to be inside a washing machine. I do wonder that. Well, here it is. Am I gonna be clean when I get to the bottom? Surely, yeah. Sometimes we can put um, soap in there so you get all nice and squeaky clean. Oh. Yeah. I think it's probably time that I get yeah. shoved inside this ball and you kick <laughs> me down the mountain. Yep. All right, cool. Yeah. High five. Nice. It's not gonna pop, right? Uh, How often have you had them well, pop? No, we haven't had any pop yet, but I always do a scope of the tracks every morning to make okay. sure there's nothing on there to puncture them. Did you oh. scope it well today? I did. I scoped it very well just for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. So here we go, guys. This is my first time getting into a Zorb and getting kicked off a mountainside. And yeah, here we go. I'm in. A lot of big echo in here. You hear that? Yeah. I kind of figured it would be a little claustrophobic, but yeah, there's a lot of room in here, a lot of headspace. This just got real. I'm about to go down the mountainside in this giant inflatable ball room thing. So I think I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's go Zorbing. I'm ready. Let's do it. Here we go. Oh. Oh man, I could hear him scream. I don't know if that screams of joy or fear, but he's rolling. He is rolling. Whoa! Oh buddy. That? It's probably the coolest thing I've ever done. Is that that a, is insane. Dream for you? You need to do this. I don't know about that. You need to do this. This it's is super, super cool. Intense. Dude, it's very intense. You're it's right. way more intense than it looks. Oh, 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 you're split. Oh, dude, you're like a little baby. You just were born. Welcome I absorbed, and now I am born. I'm born in the New Zealand way, the most epic fashion possible. I just went zorbing, and it was amazing. Oh. I'm ready to do it again. 
that was round one. Now we're gonna go back to the top for course number two, the zigzag. Here we go. Woo! Yes. Mark just finished the first set of orbing. He came out a new man. He was all wet, steamy. I call it the orb of life. It's like a womb and inside is water that's actually nutrients and it gives it sustenance. So Mark is going for round two. Pretty cold up here. I just did my first Zorb run. It was incredible. Now I'm doing run number two. Let's get in the Zorb and go for the zigzag. Here we go. Ready? See ya. Bye. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Woo! Oh, boy. Whoa! 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 Is out. Oh, oh, just like a little baby. What's up, buddy? Definitely get a little motion sick after that one. That one was way, way crazier. Hitting those edges of the zigzag is just like, whoosh, and just like flip you around. For a minute there, I was just like straight going backwards. I couldn't see where I was going. That was pretty disorienting. Whew. One more run so I can complete the tracks and get the full absorbing experience. One more run it means one more run up the hill. Here we go. And he's off in his wet socks. There it is. Final Zorb. I've got one more run to go. And this one is the most epic of all. It's called the drop. Can't even see the track, so I have no idea how big the drop is, but I've heard that uh, people get completely suspended in air to the middle of the Zorb. So should be pretty cool. Wish me luck, guys. Two runs down, one to go. Hopefully I make it and also get to keep my breakfast. Charm, that was no? ridiculous, guys. 
That one was crazy. Leaving the slopes behind, we head off to explore and immerse ourselves in the clearest water on Earth. All right, guys, we're about to go snorkeling in the Silfra Fissure, some of the clearest water visibility in all the world, and actually one of the only places that you can dive between two continents. Literally, we are standing in the fissure that separates Eurasia and North America right now. We definitely don't want water getting inside our suits because it's around two degrees Celsius, just above freezing. Time to get in. As I plunged into the water, my face was instantly met with a stinging sensation. The shock distracted me, but then suddenly, an explosion of color. This landscape was absolutely surreal, something straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel. And to top it all off, the water was 100% crystal clear. It was nearly unbelievable. The visibility in the fissure on a good day is said to extend well beyond 300 feet. And I think we can all look at this footage and confirm that that is definitely true. I can see now why so many people with the fear of heights have issues with this experience. It literally felt as if nothing was between me and the bottom of the fissure. In fact, the sensation was actually closer to that of flying than it was to swimming. That is, until I tried to actually kick with my fins. The dry suit, while providing life-saving warmth and insulation, made it nearly impossible to move. The buoyancy it created restricted my movement so much that to a large degree, I was only able to move forward by the assistance of the current. However, I will say this lack of mobility actually allowed me to relax and enjoy the experience as a whole and really take in all the color and spectacular scenery. Sometimes, it's nice to just be along for the ride. So how does a place like the Silfra Fisher come to exist? Well, as it turns out, Iceland sits smack dab on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is formed by the separation of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. In Thingvellir National Park, the separation of these plates expands nearly one inch every year. But over the course of millions of years, it has created fissures, which are filled by a natural aquifer and glacial meltwater from the surrounding peaks. This water moves slowly, very slowly, in fact, it can take up to nearly 100 years to travel and filter itself through the porous volcanic soil, making it some of the purest H2O on the planet. It is so pure, you can literally drink the water around you as you swim through the fissure. And yes, I definitely tried it out. Ooh, well, the water is cold. But I can tell you guys, this is by far the clearest visibility I have ever encountered. And oh, by the way, the water is delicious. It's about the purest water that you could ever drink. So it is one of those scenarios where you can't drink the water. It's pretty awesome. Iceland. While it is delicious, it is actually the purity and frigid temperature of the water that helps to create the vivid colors in the landscape of this environment. As I continue to drift along, I couldn't help but dream of coming back to dive this location with the team. My imagination was literally running wild, trying to picture what the scene must be like from the bottom of the fissure. And I was also beginning to wonder, what else might live down there? Is there something down there besides algae and troll grass? But just as I started to consider the idea of taking a free dive to find out, I noticed the battery on my GoPro, which was full 20 minutes prior, was now at only 1%. Wow, guys, the water is so cold that it's literally draining the life out of this GoPro. But before it dies, I just want to say that getting to circle the Sofra Fisher here in Iceland has to be one of the coolest experiences I've ever done. Trading in our fins for hiking boots, our next adventure will take us right into the crater of a volcano. Now, this volcano erupted 27,000 years ago, so we're going to see a lot of stuff like this, basalt blown out of the volcano and landed miles away. Looks like we got a little bit further to go before we get to the lava field, but man, I'm excited. This is an Adventures With Me or the books. Straight ahead. It's gotta be, it's gotta be right up here. Let's go. Oh man, this is cool. Ho oh, ho, that's the lava tube. You can see it's coming up from the earth right there. And a lava tube is pretty much a volcano's 
drainage pipe. When magma rises to the surface, there's a cap and that cap pressurizes the magma. It spreads that magma out underneath the ground, forming lava tubes just like this. It is very precarious in here. You can see that the walls are all fractured already. This makes me a little bit nervous. Usually when your gut gives you that feeling like maybe you shouldn't go too much further. That's a good warning to heed, but oh my gosh, this even goes further. If you're brave enough, I guess you could explore through these lava tubes, but I'm not sure. It's a very good idea. I think that's enough lava tube adventuring for me today. I'm gonna get back on the surface. Not a cloud in sight today. It is a bluebird sky, which means that the sun is gonna punish us. Every step is well earned out here. All right, there it is. There's our path through. This is how we're gonna get up and over this range of sandstone. If you guys are ready, we got one last heave before we see the volcano. Oh, we're gonna get scraped up. This stuff is sharp. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is it's opening up a lot. The bad news is it's getting really steep. And this is what we call scrambling. It's not walking, it's not rock climbing, it's scrambling. Gotta use your hands, gotta use your feet, gotta wedge your body in between places for more support and it happens to be a lot of fun. As tiring as it is, I'm really enjoying this. Man, I tell you what, if I was a mountain lion, that's what I would be calling home right there. Don't look down now. There it is. This is so cool. That's the volcano. Surrounded by white sandstone. All right, I think this is where we start making our ascent. I can see the grades getting pretty steep. Probably why they say this trail is for advanced hikers only. Now, volcanoes like this one are known as cinder cone volcanoes. The reason they are called that is because not only are they in the shape of a cone, but when the lava explodes, it does so in very fine fragments like this right here. These are cinders and clinkers. The clinkers have a funny name for a reason. And actually when they roll down hills, they clink. That is why it's called a clinker. Pretty cool, huh? Oh man, Corey, how we doing back there? Okay, legs are on fire. We've come a long way, look how far. Down from that valley, over that mountain, and then right here to where we're standing. Certainly a full day of adventuring. We're about to see what's waiting on the other side. All right. There it goes. Whoa. There it is. We made it. That's the crater. How cool was this, Corey? One of my favorite expeditions we've done yet. We've taken you on all these wildlife adventures over the years, and we thought it was time to show you what else was out there. So many places on this planet to explore, and we're gonna take you with us every step of the way. But, Corey, if I'm not mistaken, we have a few more steps left. Let's go down in the crater. Wow, not even to the bottom, and it is already in an incredible view. Very slippery, very hazardous. Definitely bring your hiking boots if you go on one of these adventures. <laughs> Just like that. Yes! I just gotta, gotta take a moment and just soak this in. Here we are. We made it to the finale of today's adventure inside the cinder cone volcano here at Snow Canyon State Park. And now it's time to answer the burning question. I'm sure you're all wondering, Mark, are you and Corey in any danger standing inside the crater of this volcano? No, we're not. And the reason for that is because this volcano is extinct, no longer posing a threat for an eruption. Now, that's not true with all volcanoes. So if you're gonna go on an adventure like this, somewhere else in the world, other than this park, be sure to check out if it's an active volcano or not, and be sure to check with the park services first, because some volcanoes are very, very, very dangerous, and we hate for anyone at home to go on an adventure that got themselves hurt. But this adventure was absolutely epic, if I don't mind saying so myself. We made it to the center of a volcano for the very first time on Brave Wilderness. Time to grab a helmet and clip in because our next adventure is taking us up the wall and right to the edge of a cliff. All right, yep. This is going to be our first technical rappel of the day. And in order to pull this off, we're gonna bring in the expert, my good friend, Jonathan, the Zion guru. 
who I've been on many adventures with. Jonathan, we're going canyoning today, but this is sort of where it gets technical. Yeah, in order to make our way down canyon, we're gonna have to navigate some big drops. Here's a 45 footer to start with, and uh, we're gonna use some specialized ropes and equipment to make it really safe and really fun. Okay, so Jonathan's gonna go through uh, some of the safety protocol of this rappel, and this is something that we're going to repeat multiple times on today's adventure. This is not your average rope. We have a, a Dyneema core and a Technora sheath on it. Super strong piece of equipment that's designed to hold thousands of pounds of weight so that we can effectively travel on it through these abrasive canyon conditions. Because we can't see the bottom, we're gonna use this knot to keep us from going off the end of the rope if necessary. And there's no way that that rope can slip through. All right, cool. It's about a four story building down. Not too bad. I feel very confident about all the rigging. Uh, you know, confidence is the number one asset whenever you're doing an activity like this. And I get a lot of my confidence from having a great guide like Jonathan. Safety check, now time to get on rope. And we're gonna do a uh, number two position today, right, Jonathan? That's correct, just to make sure that we have enough friction. That's a one, that's a two. This is what's called a third hand. I'm always going to have two hands on the rope at all times. This piranha is what's providing the main point of friction on the rope. It's what's going to allow me to control my rate of descent. But the third hand is my backstop. It's my backup in case like something happens and for some reason I have to take my hands off the rope, this is going to stop me. Jonathan, am I approved? Everything's click safety. Safety off. I'm now on rope. Okay, gonna just get over the edge here. Here we go. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Coming down, Corey. All right, about to make contact. Down. All right, first rappel of the day. Safety off. Off rope. All right, Jonathan, that was pretty good. Looks like you may have done this a couple times. I'm getting better. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for getting me some practice. I'm gonna pull this rope. It's unthreading like a needle from up above. Okay, let's go do it again. Here we go. Okay, so got a fork in the road here. Sounds like left That's the way we want to go. Didn't have to go far for another technical part of this canyoneering expedition. Rope! Lock that. Okay, we're locked, we're locked. On rope. A little bit more of a squeeze. Okay, yeah, this looks awesome. Woo, headed down. All right, swinging around to the left. Got a little bit of a wall behind me. All right, we're down. That was awesome, look at that. All the way back where we came from. Man, that's cool. All right, we got a, another one right behind us, but we'll wait for the rest of the team to get down here and do that again. Canyon earring, woo! Man, this is awesome. This is a little bit of a down climb. We're not going to use a rope on this one, but we are going to use pressure and friction to uh, slide and wedge our body down through this canyon. And what's really cool about this particular type of sandstone is it's super grippy. I have a lot of confidence in my footing. Fall down there would not be very much fun. Yeah, nice. Nice, dude. <laughs> That's where we just came from. That's where we're going. And you can see how narrow some of these canyons get uh, where we can actually just use friction to down climb, but then you still have some vertical drops. Uh, we definitely want to be on rope for this one. Cameraman Corey. What's up, Corey? What's up? Jonathan's helping him get set up so he can go down there and get a cool shot. But the fun part of canyoneering, it's like the challenge of actually getting to where you need to go. That's the whole point. I'm coming down. It's a little tricky at the bottom there. This is why we wear helmets. See this behind me? Don't wanna be all confident coming down and whack your head. Whoa! Like that. Well, I didn't whack my head, I whacked my hand. I'm okay though. It's a little slide, no big deal. A little okay. scrape. Good? All good, yep. All right, getting off rope. That's a nice uh, section look like. Well, not very wide. That is a pretty narrow squeeze that we're gonna have to 
scramble our way through. Gonna have to go one strap on this. It's gonna be a little too tight. And what I wanna do here is use the friction that I can create with my body to get myself through. Yeah, talk about a tight squeeze. Okay, well that does it for the Snake Canyon and all those rappels, but the biggest one is yet to come. It's time to make our way to the Wisdom Tooth. Whew. Let's go, guys. What have you? All right, here, come check this out. Corey, you see that right there, that hoodoo? That is known as the wisdom tooth, and that is the finale of today's adventure, and that is going to be spectacular. But I wanted to tell you the reason why these formations exist. Not only are they gorgeous and beautiful sandstone, look at that color. It's all to do with the chemical makeup of the sandstone. We've got calcium carbonate, iron oxide, and manganese combining to make this really erosive but beautiful color. Wind shapes all of what you see around us. And the water is what cuts the slots in the canyons. That's your quick geology lesson for this adventure. Let's get back on it. Not quite there yet. Gotta climb the wisdom tooth now. We're at the base of the tooth or the root of the tooth. And now we gotta shimmy and scramble our way up there. All right, one last little technical jaunt to the top of the tooth. A little sun flare there to mark the end of the ascent. Here we go, you guys ready for me? Here we go, I'm on belay. Wow. Woo! Top of the tooth. We made it. Oh, this is what canyoneering is all about. It's not just about the adventures through canyons like Snake Alley but it's also about getting up to these outcrops and experiencing views like this. It's an adventurer's paradise up here. All right, am I still on rope, Jonathan? Yes, sir. Okay, so still anchored in. I'm gonna make my way to the edge. Sorry, mom. She would not approve of this view. Oh, wow. Look at this. So we're about to rappel down that. Oh boy, that's a long way down. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Gonna get a cool shot, like that one, and that one. Okay, everybody, this is it. The moment you've all been waiting for. The big finale rappel down the wisdom tooth. Wish me luck, here we go. Coming down. Nice positioning mark. Saddle into it a little bit. Here we go. A little tight on that third hand. Oh man, look at how high up that was. That was epic. Now it's time to see if I can navigate my way through a cactus maze, blindfolded. If you've ever wanted to see a human pincushion, stick around for the next few minutes. This is about to get crazy. Alrighty, folks. 
Looks like we got ourselves a good old-fashioned desert showdown. No sense poking around. Let's get right to it. Two minutes on the clock. Let's give him some spins for good luck. And he's off. Ah! Ah! Oh, that man. Straight, straight. To your right. To your right. Good. Good. To, oh. to your left, Mark. To your left. Ah! Oh God. Straight. Yep. Straight ahead. Oh, watch out for that one by your leg. Ah! Ah! Back up just a little bit and then go straight. Ah! There you go. Oh, I can't see a thing. Ah. There we go. We got a little bit of a clearing. Time here. check. Time check. Uh, you got about a minute thirty. Ah! Oh. Ah! What's your chin? Ah! Which way? Oh! Oh man! Back up! Back up! Back up! Oh! Oh! oh. Okay, Mark. We gotta keep going. Right. To your right. To your right. To your right. Right. To your right. Oh, what yeah. is that? That's not another one, is it? No. Ah! Straight ahead. Ah. Yep. Side step. Step with your left leg forward. Ah. Yeah. Just go straight, Mark. Just go straight. Ah. Oh my gosh, how far am I? Halfway through, Mark. Ah, Come on. Don't get too close to those. Keep oh shuffling. God. There you go. My, my leg's seizing up, man. Well, we're in between two ah. very sharp plants. So ah. What we need to do, yep. Ah. You just turned yourself perfect. Okay. Go forward. Ah. There's a bush right below you, though. Ah, gosh, Step over that with your left leg. Ah. There you go. Ah. I guess why I do the right thing. I can't. Yeah. I'm just trying to feel for bushes shuffle. with my feet. Shuffle. There you go. Ah. Am I close? You're close. We got about 30 ah. seconds, though. We got to make it. Ah. Ah. I'm like terrified to finish this, Corey. Help me. All right, this part's tight. Ah! Dude, I'm stuck. I'm freaking stuck. Ah! Ooh, he's gonna feel that one for a while. Let's slow that down real nice like and see an instant replay. Okay, you just have to move forward. Ah! 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 You're right there. It's right ah. in front of you. You're oh, right I feel the table! Ah! Got the cake! Yes! Victory! Oh, dude, you made it with like two seconds to spare. All right. I need you guys to remove the goggles because I'm like, I can't move right now. Corey, I'm gonna need your help. How bad is it? How bad is it? It's bad, dude. Oh! Oh my goodness. Is it worth it, man? Let Take me a see. bite. Let me see. You made mm. it this far. Oh! Oh, it makes it better. That's certainly makes it better. Oh yeah, that's a good cake. Okay. We got to get these out. <laughs> All right, I really need the stuff off the back. I'm just gonna keep going, man. Ready? Okay. Oh! Oof. All right, keep going, man. Had you ever thought of starting over? Starting to the bottom again. Yep, that was the worst one. <clears throat> Tell you guys what, I am so happy I wore a cup. Okay, so here we go. Now, as you can see, I only have the Choya left that are on the front side of my body. And this is the point of the video where I would like to attempt to show you how if this happens to you, hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, how to properly remove these Choya with the least amount of pain possible. The number one thing you want to avoid doing, this is like rule number one with Choya, you never, ever, under any circumstances, try to remove Choya with your hands. Even if you have gloves on, as you can see, these things go through boots, they go through fabric. So don't use your hands, you want to use a tool. Now, what tool should you use? Well, I'm glad you asked. Corey, my comb, please. Thank you, sir. No, I'm just kidding. It's not for my hair, but one of the best tools for removing the Choya is a large tooth comb just like this. Work the teeth 
under the spines until you grab the choy. You could kind of see I've got the fruit pulling up now. Ready? One, two, three. Whew. Okay. That's one. Ooh, this one's gonna hurt. Go! Yeah! Yes! Yes, sir, that hurts. Okay, so the comb, it does the trick. But let's be honest, if you're out here hiking the Sonoran Desert, pretty good chance you don't have a large tooth comb in your kit. But what you might have is something like this. The Brave Wilderness team never leaves home without a good multi-tool, and I highly recommend you do the same. So you wanna open two points of contact, just like the comb, wiggle it in there, see how I have good purchase. Ah, that hurts. One, two, three. Velvet cake, velvet cake, velvet cake. Uh. Ah. Oh. Ah. Okay, I think I need to get this one off. This is a good opportunity for me to show you yet another technique. Corey, sticks please. Thank you, sir. Now, if you can't find any sticks, just look harder, because you definitely don't want to use your hands, like I said before. What you want to do is take the sticks, work them underneath, get purchase, and then same as the other ones. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Just like that. But I got to be honest with you. I much prefer the multi-tool, so I'm going back. Okay. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> and the final, Choya. One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> mm -mm. Oh yes, that cake was worth every single spine. Stepping out of the maze and into the unknown, our journey continues with the exploration of a haunted island. This is Swan Island one of the most notorious and haunted places in all of the Eastern United States. Back in 1936, all of the residents up and vanished, leaving behind their homes and many of their possessions that are still on the island today. We are one of the first film crews to be granted access to these abandoned houses in years. And our goal will be to find evidence to prove if the island is truly haunted. If it is, then that might be why so many residents vanished nearly 100 years ago. I'm a skeptic, like I don't, I don't really yeah. believe in like supernatural or paranormal things, you but. You would believe, I, I'm not really a huge believer on that stuff either. I mean, yeah. after being out here for three summers and being alone sometimes out here at night, it can be your mind playing tricks on you, but there are some things you just, you can't explain. One time I was down by the water and I don't see any kayaks or canoes. No one was supposed to be there that night for camping. I didn't see anyone. But at clear as day, it sounded like someone was yelling and was in distress, but no one was there. Wow. And it's kind of crazy, too, because three people drowned out there back in the 18 or 1900s. So you're maybe swaying to oh, the yeah. side where you believe that there's something going on. Mm -hmm. Part of our job was checking on the houses to make sure no animals are getting inside of them. So we were doing our normal rounds, went upstairs, and there was this bird skeleton on the ground, fully intact, except its head was a foot away from it, which is really weird. And you keep track of who's here to go yeah. in the house that's house locked off. Whoa. So can you tell us a little bit about like the last people who lived here? Like who, who was the last person to like live in the last house? Yeah, so um, that would have been the doctor. He was one of the last people probably to leave here. There's some rumors about the doctor was maybe up to some pretty strange things. Yeah, rumors of, you know, him in the occult and witchcraft and having a strange obsession with some of the villagers. So let me get this straight. The last person to live on the island was a spooky doctor who is rumored to be up to some nefarious things and all his stuff is still there. Yes. So he may also still be around? He could be, yeah. All right. Swan Island. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Well, we really appreciate both of your time. Thank you for having this fireside chat with us. And if I jump or scream, don't hold it against me. <laughs> <laughs> so, did all the residents abandon this town due to an escalation in hauntings or fear of a doctor who practiced the occult? Whatever it was, 
it might still lurk in the houses we are now setting out to explore. This is the Dumaresque house. This is where the family all tragically passed away uh, in the water. This is the house that oh. Emerald found the bird skeleton. That's right. And it's, it's abandoned. I mean, so we gotta be careful going in here. This place is probably in pretty bad shape. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, we're going in. Oh, careful, guys. This is like falling apart. Fall through the floor. Oh, oh the whole floor moves. If the uh, Dumares family's here, we don't mean any harm whatsoever. We're just walking through the house. Just want to see what's inside. Holy smokes, this is old. Look at that. It's gotta be original work. Oh, look at this. They have a support beam they wedged in there because the whole roof. Oh, oh, okay. What was that? Yep. Whoa. Yep, yep, no, yep. What'd you switch out? What happened? It was like, um, it, um, it was like someone was like, uh, like a leg was right there. And, a leg? Yeah, no kidding. I got I got on my GoPro. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna check the GoPro right now because leg I mean it was it was like somebody just uh, like it was like a okay you, you go, go right ahead it's like someone just ducked right back right right, right back in here like right in here so like pausing. they just like like they just right. went in there one two <laughs> oh man something I just saw something through the floor so you know it's you know it's really messed up about that room that you're going in what's that this is where they would put like sick people. Oh, wow. so this is closet. this is this is like back in the 30s and the 20s and like 1800s. Like when you were sick, you know, like in Harry Potter, where like when Harry Potter was bad, they put him in. Like that's where they put sick people. Like sick people. Go. I don't want to. All right, I gotta get out of this room. That is a weird. I'm not. I'm not. Honestly, I'm not looking for this kind of stuff to happen to me. Like, let's go. Whoa, dude. Look at this. Are these claw marks on the wall? Stop. Whoa. Whoa. Shh, 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 shh. Whoa. That's just me. Okay. And there's some letters. Come on down. What are the letters for? K E. K E. Let's see. If it's all right, what's, so what's this way? that way looks like a dangerous crawl space. That looks like the bird room. This is like, looks like her phone. Oh yeah, yeah, this is it. Black light time, let's do it. Shoot it. Go ahead. Oh, I can see. That's, that's gotta be where the bird the was. That's the bones. Yeah, that was you the can bones. see where there was blood here. Look at that, see all that? That, that's okay. definitely like fluid. Okay. Where'd the bird go? Upon further investigation of the Dumaresque house, I noticed a pile of scat that might be a clue to the culprit for the decapitated bird. Oh my gosh, giant poops. Bobcat? Dude, it's a bobcat. That's probably what got that bird. Yep. All right, we can tell the rangers we found the bobcat. Okay, well, I'm sold. I will not deny that that was one of the creepiest houses I've right. ever been in. We informed the rangers of the bobcat scat, but upon revealing its location, we made a startling discovery about the letters painted on the door. That wasn't there this morning. You're saying you never saw that? I didn't I notice it this morning when we came in here. Yeah, like where did they get white paint from? I don't know, because there's nothing in here that's painted. I mean, they literally were here. <laughs> no one has access inside these homes other than the rangers on the island. So things seem to be getting creepier as we head off into the night toward the next house. It, uh, it's definitely creepy. I think we should do a quick walk around and then go inside. I like the way you think. Yeah, I know. I mean, based on our story, I'd rather, like, sweep the perimeter. I'm just picking something up on the shotgun. All right. Follow the sound. Wait, wait, wait. You're right. What? Okay, what is that? Like, honestly, is this a prank? Like, did you guys have somebody go out there? I mean... Sounds like a wolf. Okay, what is that? Like, it's not going away. It's like coming and going. It sounds like a group. We're by the water. Seals. Seals? Seals. Yeah, no, that's what it is. Okay. 
<laughs> we, just heard, we just heard a group of seals. I mean, you can understand why like superstition is such like a huge thing out here because listen to that. It's like yeah. legit sounds like ghosts. Well, like you gotta yeah. be kidding me. That's that's crazy. Of course. I didn't even put together. I mean, we've been like on the island for so long, I forget that there's like an ocean right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This night is just getting weirder and weirder and weirder. Pretty sure a bobcat and some seals weren't enough to scare this town into abandonment back in the 30s. But perhaps what we're about to discover in the doctor's house would have. All right, we're doing our scariest inspection of the night. Oh, there it is. This is one of the most haunted places in the entire eastern United States. Like, this is no joke. A lot of people had some dark things happen to them, and they left. A lot of them, the whole town left, 1936. And one person stayed behind, and was still treating people like a doctor. Clearly, they're not taking care of a village. The whole residence, like, they all took off. So what was going on in this house? You heard the ranger say it occult things were rumored to be going on in this house. This is like the epicenter, we're going up the highway. Like this is this is the end all be all right here. And we are gonna go inside and walk into his laboratory. It does not get creepier than this. All right, I won't lie. <laughs> I'm on high alert right now. <laughs> I bet you are, buddy. I think I'm We gonna do this here. or what? Yep, you guys ready? Yeah. No. All right. Come on. Yeah, they took the lock off for us. Mark, you're first, man. Oh, oh, geez. Oh, come on. That's a joke. It's a big saw blade and a creepy bust. <laughs> what the heck? All right, here we go, guys. Do you hear that? What is that? You know what? I'm gonna like check behind this doctor's. This is kind of a weird looking door. Oh. Oh. Okay, I think I found the doctor's stuff. Yep, yep. These. Oh, that's sick. That's all the tools that a doctor would use. Oh, that's a vice. Yeah. That looks bone saw. Oh my god, why did I pick that up? That's this definitely is, amputated is. legs. I shouldn't have picked this up. Sorry, that's so gross. If there was a room to check out, it would be the doctor's operating room, because clearly he was doing some really creepy stuff with a bunch of really nasty tools. Whoa, is this the chair? Oh, no way. That is. That's gotta be the chair. This is a doctor of the occult, so let's see what the black light reveals. Yeah, we can turn off this. I mean, let's go lights out, gents. Lights out. Lights out. something it's not okay okay what about the uh okay. the, the heat detector yeah no you're right you're right let's do let's do the heat detector okay mark go stand over there so i can give a reference of if there's okay you see how uh mark looks you can tell mike yep yep oh. yep what? No, 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 there's, yeah there's something on the chair man look, what do you see like the paper it's right there Look at, look at, look at my, where, me? Dude, okay, 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 look. On the, on the chair, there's a circle on the chair, man. That is a hot spot on the chair. Okay, where, uh, what, part, what part of the chair? I think that's great. <laughs> like, okay, all right, I get it, that's I so see weird. it, I'm good. I'm out, I'm so out. Are you serious? Okay, I'm out, I'm out. All right, I'm let's go. I'm walking, I'm walking. We're out of here. I just want to get back to the campsite, honestly. Like, this has been a lot for me. Like, I, I do have, like, anxiety at times, and, like, my heart is racing, and, like, this is enough for me personally. Like, I don't ever want to go in that house ever again. I'm, I'm dead serious. Like, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I know, like, 
we're doing this YouTube thing and we're like looking around for stuff, I'm dead serious. Whoa. GoPro just fragged out. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it just, it literally popped up as soon as you said that. Just fragged out, I've never seen that before I go, and now, now it's. Okay. All right, let's go back. Yep, I mean, like, let's just. Bye, sorry. I'm good, I'm cutting. It's time to say goodbye to the paranormal and say hello to a very blue and scaly miracle. Deep in the heart of the Caribbean Sea, on one of its many craggy islands, lives a lizard that has been brought back from the brink of extinction and now roams this tropical landscape by the hundreds. That island is Grand Cayman, and that lizard is none other than the blue iguana. And while an iguana might not immediately strike you as being unique or noteworthy, I assure you this one absolutely is because it's blue, very blue, making it one of the most beautiful and rarest iguanas on the planet. Now to put things in perspective, these lizards dwindled all the way down to an estimated 15 total individuals in the wild, making them functionally extinct. Which is where our friend Fred Burton steps in. Directly responsible for creating the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, Fred has offered us the unique opportunity to get up close with these endangered reptiles and toward the facility he started 15 years ago. Right now, what we're doing is we're trying to find one of the resident blue iguanas that's habituated to humans. His name is Peter, and apparently he's big and friendly and a great ambassador for his species. So we're trying to get close to Peter, try to get the GoPro up close, try to get the cameras up close, so you can see why this is such a unique lizard species. So Peter's on his favorite rock. Oh, is this Peter here? Look at him, yes. Now that is an impressive iguana. All right, guys, let's uh, come in Peter's enclosure here. Wow, look at that. Let's get a shot of Peter before we approach, just in case he wants to hop off that rock, because that is a great display of a blue iguana right there. Yeah, this is a unique species. It's only found in Grand Cayman. Okay, yeah. so the blue iguana is endemic to the Cayman Islands, and it is a species of rock iguana. We've seen rock iguanas in the past, but I have never seen one this color. I mean, and you're telling me that these blue iguanas get even more blue than this. When they're in the breeding season, yeah. He's kind of dull right now. Really? Um, when he gets hot wow, and excited. Dull. I think you look great. And in March and April, when he's courting the girls, mm -hmm. he's, he, he will blaze blue. Um, really, really, really bright. Hi, Peter. Are we buddies? Are we gonna be pals? I think so. So Fred, tell us a little bit about Peter. How did he come to the uh, program and why is he so friendly? He's an interesting case because we were just walking around out in the open there a good many years ago and we saw a young two-year-old just on the gravel and we thought, where did he come from? Figured it must have been one of the free-roaming iguanas had laid and hatched and whatnot. But we start thinking, okay, we better catch it so we can get a blood sample and do the genetics and all this thing. So we're creeping up to this thing and it's just looking at us. It's not afraid, yeah. you know, and we just walk up to this iguana and pick him up and he doesn't run away. And he's been like that ever since. He's, he, he, it's like he was born without the fear gene. You know, he wow. just, he doesn't, he has no natural reaction to Friendly humans. since day one. I like it. So Peter's turning more blue because he's warming up to us. Is that what this is? He likes the attention, yeah. All right. Well, who doesn't like a good head scratch? So quick little uh, disclaimer to everybody at home. Don't go up to a wild iguana and pet it. This is uh, not uh, a normal iguana. This Definitely. is an iguana that has been habituated to humans and is used to this kind of interaction and is why we are able to get so close to Peter today. If you try to do this to a wild rock iguana, you're gonna get bit. And if you look here at Peter's mandibles, they have quite the powerful bite and they also have a couple rows of razor sharp teeth. So you definitely do not want to get your finger or your hand caught in the jaws of a wild rock iguana. So best to leave them alone and give them their safe distance. But man, are they cool. So these, um, these beads, we put on every iguana we release. And we also put them on the captive iguanas in case they get out. Mm. And the idea is the combination of bead sizes and bead colors is unique to each animal. So that, uh, you know, if we're walking around the park and we see an iguana and we want to know who that is, all we need to do is train binoculars on the beads, look them up in the database, and we'll know exactly who we're dealing with. But the other thing we do... I think do, Peter's sleeping. The other thing <laughs> we do is we photograph the sides 
and the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And these big enlarged scales, if you look at the scales on his snout here, they're all a little bit irregular. Right? They don't, they're not perfectly symmetrical. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Every iguana has a slightly different scale pattern. It's like a fingerprint. So we got pictures of this guy, and if this guy turned up somewhere he didn't want to be, and the pit tag was gone and the bead tag was gone, we'd still be able to match the photograph and say, that is that iguana. That is Peter. That is Peter. But just judge on how we're able to approach Peter, I don't think it would take very long to figure out who it was. <laughs> So one of the other cool things about rock iguanas generally are the toes. Okay. So this is like a, a hook. Looks like a talon to me. So they can, they, they're quite good at climbing trees. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, you know, they spend most of the time on the ground, but they're quite good at climbing trees. And these, these, these claws hang onto things really effectively. And for females digging nests, of course, they're great for digging too. But the, the weird thing is, you know how our hands bend like this? These guys bend like this. Oh, they bend right to left. They don't bend this way. They don't bend this way, but they bend backwards. That is very interesting, Peter. And think about why, because right there, they're constantly pulling this thing through vegetation. And now, Fred, is there any other distinct characteristic about the blue iguana that's worth noting today? I like to mention this little thing here. Okay. You see that little scale there? It looks translucent. I do. So that's the pineal eye. Mm -hmm. And that's a very primitive feature in reptiles, but these aren't primitive animals. Right. Um, light can get through there. And we think that there is a brain receptor in there. And they probably, we don't know this for sure, but we suspect that they use this for tracking day length. And that's how they subconsciously know what time of year it is and the triggers for when they need to start thinking about breeding season and all that sort of thing. Very unique sensory mechanism. Very yeah. cool, Peter. A lot of the stuff that I've described to you is useful because what we need always is for people to relate to these animals. If we want to conserve an animal like this, people need to be engaged in it, right? right? And the thing about an animal like this is it's, it's, it, it responds to us in a way. We can, we can understand it. We can empathize. So knowing about the iguanas helps us tell stories about them. And we tell stories about these iguanas and people start to love them. And if people start to love them, they want us to preserve them. And that's, that's the way it all works. Well, I think Peter has done a phenomenal job today hanging out with us so we can learn more about his species. And as far as lovability, I mean, I think the proof is right here, guys. This is about the coolest customer I've ever witnessed when it comes to an iguana. Thank you very much for hanging out, Peter. And thank you, Fred. Really appreciate the tour of the facility. Great work on bringing back this population of beautiful reptiles. And if you want to find out more about this program, make sure to check out the link in the description below. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next location. Bye, Peter. See you later, buddy. Without the efforts put in place by Fred and now sustained by the National Trust's Blue Iguana Recovery Program, these lizards would almost certainly no longer exist in the wild. What they have done for the blue iguana is truly remarkable and always makes us proud to tell one of these heroic efforts to save such a special creature. If you would like to catch a glimpse of the famous blue iguana for yourself, drop by the Queen Elizabeth II Botanic Gardens website to book a tour with the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, where you can get up close with this endemic species and if you're lucky enough, may even get to meet Peter himself. But just don't disturb him if he's resting. The star of the island needs his beauty sleep.